This is the lecture for European history for Monday, the 30th of November, 2020, just after Thanksgiving break. And I do hope that everyone here and at home had a good Thanksgiving break. Last week before the vacation, you were introduced to Versailles culture by me and by clips from the movie Marie Antoinette. You will need to understand what it means when somebody says, this, madame, is Versailles. And if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, you've forgotten the film clips, which you are responsible for seeing and obliged to see. Now, uh, we're going to finish with Louis XIV, Louis XIV, uh, with his uh, wars. Had Louis died uh, around the year 1700, he would have been considered a great conqueror. There was a time when Louis threatened England with invasion, just like the Spanish Armada. Uh, a series of naval defeats and naval victories for Britannia put paid to that. Louis also, and this is where his legacy is much more real, moves the border of France eastward, away from the Atlantic towards the Rhine, which is here. This area, which is now the Benelux countries and uh, Alsace-Lorraine, is a borderland that is perpetually fought over between uh, Germany and France. The reason that they're independent is because the British did not want either Germany or France as a powerful continental power to control the Dutch coast and the Belgian coast. It was bad enough that France controlled Calais at the nar narrowest point across the English Channel. But a strong hostile European continental power in possession of the Dutch and Belgian coasts uh, and enough wealth to build a real navy would be a serious threat to Britain's independence. So Britain maintained a policy of balancing the great powers. Britain would always side with the weaker of the European powers against the stronger of the European powers to limit the power that the stronger European powers has. Because so long as there was a balance of power in Europe, there was a place for an independent Britain and British Empire. But if, like the Spanish tried to do, like Louis XIV tried to do, like Napoleon later did for a little while, and like Hitler later did for a little while, if a continental leader controls all of Europe, like a latter-day Roman Empire, then Britain is definitely threatened. So British policy, just in general terms, is to side with the weaker power against the stronger continental power in order to prevent that stronger continental power from becoming hegemon. Hegemon is an old Greek term. It means dominion, dominant power of. Since the Cold War, the United States has been the global hegemon. China is trying to supplant us. Uh, we'll see what happens with that over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, before that, both the Soviets and the Americans were dual hegemons uh, in different regions of the world. Before that, the, Britain, uh, the British Empire was for a couple of hundred years. So when Louis moves the border eastward, he actually joins two regions which are going to become important in subsequent history. These regions are Alsace and Lorraine. Alsace and Lorraine, or Alsace-Lorraine, is located to the west of the southern and central Rhine River. They include the Vos Mountains, V-O-S-A-G-E-S. -E I don't know. I don't understand French. Uh, what all I always thought was the Vosage, but no, it's the Vos Mountains. Um, and the western bank of the southern central Rhine River. This is going to be important. These areas traditionally had been German, German-speaking. In fact, English people call German shepherd dogs Alsatians because of World War I, World War II, they didn't want to be saying, yeah, I have a German shepherd dog and the Germans are killing your nephew right now on the, on the Western Front. So they call them Alsatians because Alsace or Alsace was a part of Germany for so long. But Louis in the late 1600s, brings that part of Europe into French uh, control and into metropolitan France. It becomes a part of France. This is going to matter 
because the French and the Germans are going to fight back and forth over who controls Alsace-Lorraine from the time of Louis' conquests up to the through the end of World War II. That's, let's see, the entire 1700s, the entire 1800s, and half of the 1900s. That's 250 years. And for the moment, at least, France seems to have won that. Uh, particular contest with the help of, I don't know, the United States, Britain, and the Russians. But we'll see what happens in the future. Now, Louis then overreaches. He fails to bring a plausible threat to bear on Britain. And in southern Germany, he encounters the Duke of Marlborough, whose last name happens to be Churchill. In fact, he's the great-great-grandfather of Winston Churchill, whose picture is up there, who saved the world in World War II from the Nazis. Uh, the Duke of Marlborough, Mr. Churchill, leads an army of English troops allied with a German army under Prince Eugene. And at the Battle of Blenheim, which is a turning point battle of, of world history, uh, the forces of Louis XIV are crushed by the Duke of Marlborough, and Louis loses much, but not all, of his conquests. He ends up holding on to Alsace-Lorraine, but not much else. So in the end, Louis's wars of conquest are uh, end in defeat. They are a failure for the most part. Um, and the world uh, learns even more about the Churchill family, and there becomes the namesake of a famous brand of cigarettes from the 20th century, Marlboro's. Which I never smoked. When I smoked, I smoked camels. You're going to get lung cancer, get it, you know, for real. <sighs> In any event, um, so that's it on the uh, culture of Versailles and Louis XIV. You understand it's an imitation of China for a variety of reasons transplanted to Europe. Do you have any questions about Versailles culture before we go into uh, the next section, which I'm skipping ahead a little bit? Sam, do you need a notepad? Okay, do, do take it out. Yes. Would I be able to get a notepad, please? Yes. There you go. And we're now going ahead to item F, mercantilism. F is in Foxtrot, mercantilism. You know what? Yes, I would like one first. There you go. Well, so, mercantilism is the economic theory that dominates the early period of colonization, basically the 15, 1600s. It really takes off in the 1700s. And it isn't until the Napoleonic Wars and a little bit after that it begins to, it becomes overthrown. What mercantilism is, is the theory that the key to economic success, it is the theory, mercantilism, the theory that the key to economic success is the mother country growing its gold reserves and silver reserves. The belief that the key to economic success is for the mother country, I'll explain that, to increase its gold and silver reserves. Mercantilism is the economic theory that says the key to economic success is for the mother country to increase its gold and silver reserves. So, to increase its gold and silver reserves. What does that mean? First off, the mother country. Whenever you have an empire in this period, uh, there is a mother country. What is the mother country of the French Empire? So obviously it's the European country that dominates the empire. France for the French Empire, Britain for the British Empire, and so uh, Holland for the Dutch Empire, <coughs> or the Netherlands. So you have as your goal for everything that you do economically, if you're in charge of a country, your goal is to slowly but surely, maybe quickly but surely, increase your gold and silver reserves. That means that all that you do is, design, is based on a win-lose proposition. Whenever we encounter one another, I win, you lose. Or you win, I lose. 
There is no mutual advantage. It's got to be one side wins, the other side loses. What this means is that the Europeans are not going to be in a cooperative mood with one another. They are engaged in hardcore life or death economic competition. In this competition, sea power, trade, and colonies all play a role. Why are colonies established? Colonies are established in order to enrich the mother country. That's their purpose. In mercantilism, which is not the only purpose, this supplants God, glory, and gold. In mercantilism, this supplants God, glory, and gold. In mercantilism, the point is for sea trade and colonies to enrich the mother country. So you establish colonies that are going to give your empire economic resources. But those colonies don't exist for their own sake. They don't exist for the benefit of the colonials. The colonials exist to benefit the treasury of the mother country. Everything comes down to that. Mercantilism is ultimately going to be the prime cause of the American Revolution. As much as anything else, this economic theory. Because what mercantilism says is, I am a tool of statecraft. Let's say I'm a farmer in Virginia or Massachusetts. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter whether I have slaves or not in this example. I'm a farmer. Now, in order to run my farm, I need nails. I need iron or steel tools uh, of various kinds. I need access to a blacksmith. Now, I happen to have a cousin who's a successful trained blacksmith who wants to come over from England and start his trade. He wants to come over from Goldchester. He wants to come to my farm's village and set up a, 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 a practice. But to do this, he needs an anvil, a bellows, and the other tools of the blacksmith's trade. And he can't bring them from home. He's leaving. His, uh, his partner is going to get the shop. So how are we going to get him the anvil and all of the uh, bellows and all of the other tools of the blacksmith's trade? Well, here we are in British North America. And it happens that we know somebody in French North America who has some bellows. And they're willing to sell us for a really good price. They'll ship it from the St. Lawrence Valley around to wherever we happen to be. And as to the anvil, there's a Dutch trader that comes along the coast, and he is selling anvils at about half the price it would cost me to buy that same product and have it shipped from England. So if we buy the French bellows from French North America near Quebec, and if we buy the Dutchman's anvil, we're going to save a lot of money, and that means we'll have more money to start my nephew's business, and that gets me nails and other steel and iron implements at good prices. But there's a problem. The law says I can only buy finished products from England through English merchants, merchants. and they know that I and my fellow colonials are in a captive market. They know that we can't just buy from the lowest bidder. We have to buy from them. And because we have to buy from them, we are not in the best economic shape. I either become a lawbreaker, and if I get caught, I'm still subject to the medieval law codes that England still has. I might have my eyes put out. I might be put to the torture. There are all sorts of bad things that could happen. I could end up becoming a slave or an indentured servant. Yeah, people lost their freedom. They became slaves. Slaves, wasn't, slaves aren't just for Africans. Slavery is not just for Africans. It's for all sorts of people. You can become an indentured servant. You can become a slave. There are all sorts of bad things that can happen. So I either spend ridiculous amounts of money to get my nephew his tools, or I become a lawbreaker. And this economic pressure from mercantilist theory is going to cause me and other colonials to get mighty angry with the British, and ultimately revolt. But according to mercantilism, I'm just a selfish, whiny baby. Because, in fact, my job 
and I should be proud to do this, is as an Englishman, as a British colonial, to uh, strengthen the economy of the mother country by making sure that gold flows into the mother country, not out of it. Do you see the problem here? It's the same problem the Athenians had in their empire. Now, if you remember, during the uh, time of the Delian League and the Athenian Empire, up through the end of the Peloponnesian Wars, Athens was an empire. And you'd think, Athens, what a great empire. They've got democracy. Yeah, they've got democracy if you're Athenian. But if you're not Athenian, you're a second-class citizen. Let's say you come from Delos, the namesake of the Delian League, which was a, a trick to get countries to sign up to become allies of Athens and later subjects and colonies of Athens. If you're Delian, the Athenians rule over you. You're a second-class citizen in your own country. The Athenians never give anyone that they rule any reason to buy into the Athenian Empire. The Athenian Empire is a taker. The Romans didn't do this, the Persians didn't do this, later the British didn't do this. Any empire that's going to last can't be so selfish. They have got to give the conquered peoples a reason to become loyal. The Romans offered citizenship. You could become a citizen, whether you're from Delos or Athens or Rome, if, you're if your family is of service to the empire and you're an aristocrat you can become as fully Roman as somebody born on the shores of the Tiber, on the Capitoline Hill. The Persians were very, very loose with their rule. As long as you gave them sub uh, servitude, paid your taxes, and sent troops when they asked you to, basically they'd let you run your own affairs to a great degree. That made the Jews incredibly loyal to the, to the Persians. But mercantilism makes the European empires scrimy. What I mean by scrimy, it's the it's main expression, is cheap, miserly. And dealing with somebody who's cheap and miserly, as opposed to somebody who's basically generous of spirit, is obnoxious. But all the European empires were into this, they believed in mercantilism. And that made them scrimy, that made them cheap. Now the great classical trade route of the mercantile period is the triangle trade, which is what we're going to start talking about now. For those of you at home, let's see if we can take a good look at this map. Okay. Let's see. I don't want to block anyone. Let's try that. Okay, so we start out in Europe, and why not? Europe is where you have finished goods. You've got um, beads, clocks, mirrors, other things that people like. You've also got guns and booze, and guns and booze will always sell. You want to make a living in the worst and best economies? You can go into the undertaking business because people will always die and need to be buried. Or you can go into selling booze or guns. And uh, as long as you are legally able to do those things, buy and sell booze and guns, you will always have customers. So, Europe produces finished go goods. Beads, mirrors, clocks, booze, and guns. And they ship those finished goods to what I call the Guinea Coast. And the Guinea coast of Africa is that area of Africa that if Africa is like a, a, a face facing this way, this is the area under the chin. It's basically from Senegal and the Gambia all the way to, um, uh, let's see, uh, pr pretty much uh, what used to be the French, well, I think what, it, what still is the French Congo uh, or Congo Brazzaville. So this region here, which contains about a dozen countries today, uh, is roughly the Guinea coast. And at the Guinea coast, the people with the finished goods trade uh, in coastal trading port uh, posts that are sometimes fortified. They have little castles. You can see them. Slaver castles, they're called today. Uh, and these castles are occupied by a few Europeans. And usually they have the help of Arab traders. Arab traders, because the Muslims have penetrated this area. There are pagans here. There are soon to be Christians here. 
Uh, but there are also Muslims here. Uh, there are people of Islamic faith, uh, of African ethnicity. The finished goods are traded to the Arabs or to the slavers who live permanently in the castles. There are a few of them. The beads, clocks, and mirrors are traded to friendly India uh, to friendly native chiefs. And the native chiefs on the one hand, and the Arab traders on the other hand, provide the bulk of the slaves. The image of slavers at this time is you've got, and you're going to see this when we when we when we see a movie version of this, uh, is you have a European who is leading a group of uh, Africans uh, to capture natives. But that was rare. What was much more common was you pay off the local chieftain. The local chieftain uh, gives you the people he doesn't like. People who might be rebels, families who are obnoxious, uh, people who constantly argue, um, maybe people who are sickly, mentally feeble. He gets rid of the people he doesn't need or want in his tribe anymore. He gets to practice a little primitive eugenics. He also gets to cleanse the tribe of his enemies. Or, better yet, he'll team up with other chieftains and some slavers to go after an enemy tribe. A tribe that has been a thorn in his tribe's side for generations. Well, now, with the help of slavers, he's going to help and ca capture them. In any case... Native chiefs provide most of the slaves. Those that aren't are provided by the Arabs who come through and trade in black slaves. They'll buy them from the native chiefs or they'll capture them themselves and they'll sell them to the uh, European slavers on the coast. So the finished goods are used to pay off this system of native chiefs. The native chiefs are not going to get guns. That's agreed upon. They might get booze. They're going to be getting the trinkets. The Arabs may get guns, may or may not get booze, depending upon how devoutly Muslim they are, because Muslims are not supposed to drink. And uh, they'll get wealth, and the, and the coastal uh, castle-dwelling uh, slave uh, traders will, will, will be able to buy all of it. And what they end up filling the ships with, because the ships that had finished goods now have empty cargo holds, they fill them with slaves. Now, these slaves then are sent across the Middle Passage, the notorious Middle Passage. And the Middle Passage is from the Guinea coast of West Africa to two places. The Caribbean is where most of the slaves end up going. The southern region of British North America, north of Spanish Florida, that gets the rest. Northern British North America, very little, very few slaves. The, the agriculture doesn't require big plantations. You don't need lots of slave labor. At this time, the sugar island of Jamaica was more valuable to the British Empire than all of British North America on the mainland. Why? Because sugar was the crop. Sugar was the product that everyone wanted. Europeans were being introduced to the, for, the first, for the first time to pure cane sugar. They liked it. And suddenly Europeans became devotees of sweet dessert treats and sweet candies and sweet cookies and uh, a new trade in dentistry for tooth decay began to thrive because Europeans uh, began eating huge amounts of sugar, which is not natural. So uh, the slaves are brought over and sugar and spices that are now grown in the Caribbean uh, are, are, are produced here. This area is very profitable. Now, to give you a sense of the region, you have the Lesser Antilles, which are these little islands that stretch up from Trinidad and Tobago uh, up all the way up towards Puerto Rico. Here you've got Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, which concludes today Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and the island of Cuba. Cuba, or Cuba, uh, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico are the Greater Antilles. Together, the Lesser Antilles and the Greater Antilles are uh, the West Indies, not the East Indies. That's where Columbus thought he was. It's not where he was. He was in the West Indies. The East Indies are now Indonesia. Uh, the West Indies are now Cuba, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Puerto Rico, and a bunch of other areas uh, in the Little Islands. So 
The majority of slaves go here. Some of the slaves, however, go to the mainland. Because in southern British North America, say that ten times fast, quietly to yourselves, southern British North America is the producer of the second great product, the greatest product from the mainland other than timber, which is tobacco. Timber is important because you've got virgin forests here in North America that can supply the British with thousands of ships of top quality because of the wood that you can get in these uh, heretofore unharvested forests. Uh, you also get tobacco. Tobacco, not cotton, is the big product of the southern uh, British North American colonies before the American Revolution. Cotton only becomes big after the Industrial Revolution takes off. There's some cotton grown here, but it's primarily tobacco, molasses, and timber that comes from southern British North America. Now, these raw materials are then sent back to Europe, and uh, that is the third leg of the triangle trade. Now, as to the Middle Passage, there are a couple of ways that you can pack your vessel. There's some things you should understand about slave ships. There were two kinds of vessels that people could smell before they saw them on the horizon. That's how, if they were downwind, you could smell a whaling ship or a whaler. Because what whaling ships do, unless you're in Moby Dick, is they hunt whales, they bring the, the killed whales alongside, they slice them up alongside, and the sliced blubber is rendered down into whale oil um, on the deck of the ship. And there's this constant stink of, uh, of, of melting whale oil uh, and dead whale carcass. And it was just this fetid foul reek that went across the ocean downwind, sometimes hundreds of miles. The other ship that you could smell before you saw across the horizon, the horizon reference about 20, 25 miles away, is uh, a slaver or a slave ship. Because you've got, depending upon the size of ship, the cargo hold completely filled with human bodies that are locked there most of the time. Now, there are two basic ways that you can pack a slave. Loose pack and tight pack. Oh, getting all of this fun. Okay. Loose pack is you pack the slaves feet, head, feet, sort of up, you know, like this, like this, like this, like this, on their backs. And they're chained on their backs. That's the merciful way. If you do loose pack, you can load fewer slaves, but more of them will survive the passage. Then, there's tight pack. Tight pack is you load them in on their sides. And you can fit in more slaves, but more of them will die on the passage. It's a gamble which way you're going to get more profit from. Are you going to get more profit? Let's say you've got a cargo hold that'll hold uh, 200 loose pack slaves. Just a small slaver. Usually they've shipped more than that. Let's, let's say more than that. Okay. We can ship 350 slaves loose pack. Load them in in the, West, in the Guinea coast. Unload them anywhere from Trinidad and Tobago up to Virginia. Maybe 80, 90% survived the journey. So what's 85% of 350, math people? Somebody calculate that, please. 350 times 0.85 equals. It's a calculator. Well, at least you're trying to do it. Thank you, sir. 298. 298 slaves make it. Now, let's say I pack in 400. Keep it out. You're going to need it. Let's say, let's say I pack in 450 to, well, we'll make it 500. We're going to really pack them in. 500 slaves, tight pack. But 60% will survive. Uh, 65. We're going to be real good. 65% of 500. How many is that? 325. Ooh. So in that gamble, I made more by tight pack. But what if I only keep 50%? Then you only got 250. 
Oh, yeah, that's 250. Yeah, so not as good. So it's a gamble. And if you are running a slave ship like any other business, your job is to make money for your shareholders and uh, to justify your existence. So some people did loose pack, other people did tight pack. Now, I have been speaking about this as a business because that is what it was. It is so easy for modern people in the post-industrial world to whine about how obviously evil slavery was. And yet every human society, without exception, that was a civilization, engaged in some form of slavery before the industrial era. In fact, we benefit from slavery today. There are two types of slavery that survived the British Empire's attempt to eradicate slavery in the 1800s. Yes, the British Empire was one of the greatest world forces for good in that it tried hard. It fought many wars to try to end the slave trade. God bless the British Empire for that. Um, today, there is the sex slave trade, which is everywhere. Little girls and little boys, sometimes very, very small, sometimes even infants, but usually older than that, are captured or sold by their families to unscrupulous people who will then give them lives that you can't even begin to imagine how horrible they are. And this happens here in the United States. It happens in the most developed countries of Europe. It happens throughout the third world. It happens a lot in Asia. It is, it is a horror and a tragedy and a travesty. And uh, the fact that it still thrives is a shame on everyone. To the extent that we are aware of it. The second type of slavery uh, that is growing is government uh, slavery in totalitarian police states. Most of the people in North Korea are effectively slaves to their government. Increasing numbers of Chinese are effectively slaves of their government. In China, the Uyghur population of Muslims in Xinjiang are slaves. Uh, the Tibetans, natives, are slaves. Uh, more and more people are being enslaved by these governments uh, to use as cheap labor. How can a Chinese city encourage an American factory or German factory to come and establish production facilities there. Well, they can promise that instead of having to pay workers 15, 20, 25 dollars an hour and provide them with social welfare benefits like they have to do in the United States or in Germany, um, their labor costs can be less than a dollar an hour and don't worry about the social services. We'll take care of all of that. Not, not wink, wink. And what that is basically is an invitation to open up a slave sweatshop where people basically are chained to their desks and they work and they sleep and they live as tools in a greater machine. That's growing. That kind of slavery is growing. Um, organ harvesting is a variant of that kind of slavery, uh, which again, the Chinese have practiced for decades. But the kind of slavery that we're looking at here is the kind of slavery that the Romans were familiar with, that the Chinese were familiar with back when they were an empire. And that is, you have a plantation economy. You've got these very large farms, and they produce crops for the market, and they produce crops for the survival of the local people. But to operate at a large scale, you can't have family farms. You need these larger structures, at least that's what they find. They always lose the family farm and you end up with these giant plantations that operate with slave labor. After the Punic Wars, what destroys the Roman economy? All the prisoners that the legions captured are now slaves. Slaves flood the economy. Sixtus can't find a job when he leaves the legions. His family farm has been gobbled up by a local plantation. He goes to Rome and he has to become a client to a wealthy patron because Sixtus, a Roman, a free man uh, from a free family of free farmers, now has to basically become the tool of a wealthy man because he can't make a living because all the jobs are taken up by slaves. 
because any blacksmith or carpenter that would hire this former soldier would lose money having to pay a free man a wage when all of his competitors used slaves. Slaves end up dooming the Roman Republic. They bring in the Roman Empire. Slavery is necessary in every big civilization until we develop the machines of the Industrial Revolution. The truth is, our cushy lifestyle, to the extent we have one, is cushy because we have machines do so much of our work. In the 18, 17 and 1800s and early 1900s, most of grunt work has been converted to mechanized work. And mechanized work requires far fewer people and produces far more stuff, including food. Industrial farming techniques is what allows us a global population between 6 and 7 billion people. Without industrial farming techniques, if we went back to organics, most of the world's population, probably nine-tenths, would die of starvation. You need the industrial farming techniques to support the population we have. We benefit from machinery. We benefit also, you who are female, uh, from the fact that uh, the mechanization of the home makes it possible for women to, in the United States in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, in Europe uh, about a decade later, give or take, to leave the home and enter the workforce. And there are economic reasons why this happens, but it's not just that people suddenly woke up to the idea that sexism is wrong. People woke up to the idea that it's possible to have a decent standard of living without a housewife living at home all the time. It's not what every woman chooses. It's not what every woman has to do. But today, most women work in our society, uh, either because they choose to or because they have to. Um, because you got machinery at home that does a lot of the work that a housewife used to do. And as to the men, you have a lot of unemployed men because machines do the work in factories that men used to do 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. For people who have machines as slaves, it's pretty rich to get on our high horse and talk about how stupid and evil our ancestors were. But I promise you, in almost every other history class that you have, you will hear about how horrible, quote, we, unquote, are for having had slavery. Well, A, everyone had slaves, including Africans of one another, and B, um, what is different about our society is the moment we develop factories, we get rid of slavery. The British Empire puts a stop to the global slave trade to the extent it can. The United States fights our bloodiest war to get rid of slavery. And we then, a hundred years later, rip our society apart to try to make us a more equal society. And we're doing the same thing again today. Yeah. Do we have racism in our past? Our society sure does. Are we unique in that? Absolutely not. Have we tried to do something about the racism and the slavery? Yes. Has everyone else? Absolutely not. In our society, it is both important to recognize the history that's there of racism and of slavery, while at the same time recognizing that very, 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 very unusually, we chose to change, which is not true of so many other societies on Earth. That matters. Now, we're going to spend the rest of today's class and a good deal of tomorrow's class seeing scenes from a movie uh, television um, uh, special called Roots, which in the 1970s was something that most Americans saw. It was over a two-week period broadcast. I was in junior high school when it was. And unlike anything that you can imagine being broadcast today, it was a national event. There were only three networks then, and this was a very well-told and powerful story about an African who was captured and brought into slavery and his family's story from the capture up through the Civil War and afterwards and the KKK. So we're going to see some of the opening scenes of that today and tomorrow. It is a television movie, therefore it's rated G, but you're going to see some nudity. It's National Geographic style nudity. You're going to see Native women without tops because Native women did not always wear tops. It's not at all sexual. What you're seeing are scenes of brutality, uh, but the nakedness was shown on national television in 1977 uh, because that was authentic. 
So those of you at home, I'll have some clips. Uh, those of you here, I'll start it up in a moment. <laughs> 